Hello and welcome to the Albuquerque Museum. We're here today with uh, Dr. Nick Estes and a series of scholars who are going to be discussing themes around the exhibition, Seven Generations of Red Power in New Mexico, which is currently on view online at our museum website, which is cabq.gov slash museum. I'm gonna introduce Dr. Nick Estes and then hand this panel over to him to introduce everyone else. A citizen of the Lower Brule Sioux tribe, Dr. Nick Estes is a assistant professor of American studies at the University of New Mexico. He is a historian, journalist, and host of the Red Nation podcast. He's also the founding editor of Red Media Collective, which publishes books, podcasts, and stories highlighting indigenous intelligence in all its forms. His writing and research engage decolonization, indigenous histories, environmental justice, and anti-capitalism. And he's been featured in The Baffler, The Guardian, The Nation, High Country News, Indian Country Today, NBC News, and The Intercept. In 2019, Estes was awarded the Lannan Literary Fellowship for Nonfiction. He is currently a 2020-2021 Freedom Scholar with the Marguerite Casey Foundation and the Group Health Foundation. Estes is the author of the book, Our History is the Future, Standing Rock versus the Dakota Access Pop Pipeline and the Long Tradition of Indigenous Resistance. He is the co-author of two books coming out in 2021 on police abolition and indigenous environmental justice. He's also currently working on a book on the history of red power. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Nick Estes. I just want to send a Lakota greeting uh, to everyone who is listening to this panel, but also to my friends and relatives and colleagues on this panel today. Um, I'm calling or I'm recording this conversation in uh, Tiwa lands in what is known as Albuquerque, New Mexico. And it was a great honor uh, to be in collaboration with the Albuquerque Museum especially people such as Elizabeth Becker, Leslie Kim, my co-creator of this particular exhibit, Rebecca Prinster, as well as uh, Jessica Coyle for setting up this uh, virtual conversation today. And to give a little bit of background uh, on this exhibit, on what it is and what it isn't, and so some of the limitations that we encountered in creating this exhibit um, during COVID-19. So the history of indigenous resistance in, in what is now called New Mexico stretches back as far as the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. At that time, Spanish colonizers had enslaved Pueblo people, taken over their lands and attempted to convert them to Catholicism. In a united effort to expel the Spanish, almost all of the 40 surviving Pueblo groups joined forces to overthrow their invaders. This was the beginning of red power as we trace it in this exhibit, the fight to pers preserve community, culture, and tradition. So over the last 340 years since the Pueblo revolt, the struggles that indigenous peoples of New Mexico have engaged in have changed little. They continue to fight for their sovereignty over their lands, freedom from settler violence, and access to resources, even as they face uh, forced sterilizations, child removal, the dangers posed by resource extraction, police violence, and the theft of their traditional homelands. Their story is, is not unlike that of indigenous peoples across North America. Native peoples of New Mexico have also engaged in activism outside of the region at the occupation of Alcatraz in 1969 to 1971, Wounded Knee in 1973, and Standing Rock in 2016. Red power has been present in New Mexico since the first attempt to exterminate native peoples from the land, but it was first given a name in 1967 by Clyde Warrior, who was a member of the Ponca tribe in Oklahoma. He was instrumental in founding the National Indian Youth Council or NIYC in Gallup, New Mexico in 1961. The organization brought up young leaders to fight for tribal sovereignty, treaty rights, self-determination and cultural preservation with the urgency befitting of the 1960s. 
NAYC was influential in, found in, in the founding of not only the Red Power Movement, but what was later known as you know, the, the kind of more militant arm of tribal sovereignty. And that story often doesn't get, it often gets overshadowed uh, by the creation of the American Indian Movement in Minneapolis in 1968. But nonetheless, it's important to highlight the origin story of Red Power as originating from these lands and from this particular history. So I wanna talk a little bit about the title of the exhibit, which is called Seven Generations of Red Power in New Mexico. Many societies use, the con use a concept of seven, seven generations to talk about change in history. And in this particular exhibit, we use Vine Deloria Jr.'s conception of seven generations to know where you are and know where you've been. And to know where you're going, you must consider three generations in the past, three generations in the future, and the current generation standing in the middle of that lineage. Your actions today will impact the next three generations of head, ahead of you. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce our first uh, panelist, um, somebody who is uh, was there at the beginning of a lot of these uh, recent or these uh, original struggles and formations of the Red Power Movement, um, Dr. Simon J. Ortiz, who is a retired Regents professor at Arizona State University. He's also a writer, poet, editor, author of numerous books, all focused on indigenous uh, native community, history, cultural and social identity, political struggles and resistance. He's also a member of the Acoma Pueblo Nation, a member of the Dayami Hano, or the Eagle Clan, and a former tribal interpreter and first lieutenant governor of Acoma. He's also the father of three grown children and a grandfather and a great grandfather. I'll turn it over to you, uh, Dr. Ortiz. Well, hello, how are you? How's everybody? Well, good. Well, that's good because we all want to be well taken care of by ourselves and well taken care of by the land, mm -hmm. which is known in the Akama language, the Hatsi. Hatsi is the land and we are all part of it. And our living comes from Hatsi, the land. In the older traditional way, you know, when people believed that they were really part of the earth, we still do as as Akuma people uh, who come from the land. When somebody asks so where we're from, we say from here, we come from here, you know, which is our land, our land, our source. I uh, am a writer and a poet, and I hope that uh, all of you have read some of my works uh, in poetry and some essay and uh, nonfiction and uh, fiction as well. All of that writing, of course, comes from the oral tradition in a sense for all indigenous people in the Americas and other indigenous peoples throughout the whole world. That is the planet Earth, the mother Earth that we know to be our source. And so our knowledge of ourselves, my identity, your identity, our identity, that's where who we are uh, comes from, from the earth, from the mother, from our source, that we are dependent upon and we are interdependent in a, in a sense, uh, maybe the primary sense of the word dependency, because it has to do with dependent upon the source of our life, the creation, whatever we call it in our indigenous languages, we also know it as the deepest and center part of ourselves and all people really and all beings in this uh, uh, life source that we know as uh, um, uh, who, who we are in terms of our people, our culture and our life philosophy and system. Well, I want to uh, start with uh, how uh, 
the value of being who we are as indigenous people has to do with uh, has to do with uh, what we are struggling to uh, maintain ourselves, to be sustainable to ourselves. That is, uh, as people, as living, as living beings, and that has to do with uh, how we, not only Akama people or uh, Lakota people or Tene you know, the Navajo Nation and and its people or any other people throughout the Americas who are the original or aboriginal indigenous uh, population of this hemisphere, the Western hemisphere. Well, uh, we, our living is uh, dependent upon our beliefs. And so in terms of uh, our existence, uh, we know ourselves through the cultural guidance that our oral tradition gives us that we uh, believe that we came from here. As I said just a little while uh, earlier, that our source is the earth, because we came or arose from the earth and from her, the mother provider, the mother source of all, of, of all our lives. And so, to protect it, we have to maintain our sense of responsibility for what it is as dirt, as soil, as water in the uh, rivers or streams or uh, the ocean and uh, the rain, that's the liquid, the substance that we know as water, which is essential to our lives. We come from that and therefore we have to be bound by it. We are responsible and by obligation, you know, to maintain its uh, healthfulness and its uh, um, uh, crucial, crucial nature to our bodies, to our um, uh, growing, uh, uh, engendering uh, ourselves in next uh, future generations. You know, if we don't take care of ourselves now, then our future generations are not going to be able to uh be uh, the future generations you know well when we were discovered quote unquote you know by other people namely europeans who came to this land uh, as as if it were a new world it, it may have been a different people a different uh uh, belief system that they came from, but they called us the new world as if we were some kind of uh, savior, which we were not, you know, but of course, uh, you know, we uh, uh, went undergo, uh, we went under uh, circumstances that, uh, that the Europeans brought. Uh, upon our discovery by uh, so-called discovery of uh, Christopher Columbus in uh, 1492, uh, you know, in the in the Caribbean, when he and his uh, crew uh, on an expedition from Spain uh, came um, into the Americas, you know, and and found people or being who were not. Uh, uh, different, I'm sure, in terms of human um, appearances than, than who they were, you know. Uh, Christopher Columbus, a Italian who was a sailor who was working for the, uh, uh, the regime, the royal regime in Spain, and uh, who had hired him or uh, uh, whatever you supported him to uh, uh, sailed his ship across the sea, which is now the Atlantic, and uh, came upon the Americas, which were not known as the Americas, and discovered or found our Hanno, our people, people from the Caribbean. Of course, uh, that's quite a distance from New Mexico. Well, the first peoples were uh, uh, indigenous peoples, you know, obviously. The tribal names uh, are uh, whoever and whatever language they spoke, you know, that they knew themselves by. 
just like here at the same time in the 1492, which was centuries and centuries ago, you know, we knew who we were and the people there in the Caribbean Sea, which is now the Caribbean Sea, um, uh, you know, was the source of those people there. Well, that was the first time when we were in encountered by the uh, uh, Europeans. Time passes and passes and sometimes we don't know exactly uh, what that means in terms of uh, how fast or how slow, but uh, by uh, 1598, the era uh, next century uh, from 1490s uh, to uh, uh, 1590s, uh, 1598 was when Juan de Oñate brought the uh, exhibition, which I mean, uh, not ex uh, exhibition, but expedition from Mexico uh, to into the American, what is now the American Southwest and New Mexico. This was the first time that the uh, Mejano, Acoma people encountered the uh, uh, different people from uh, from Europe, uh, different people, the uh, white people, Shamozi, Hanno, you know, the white appearing people. And so the then that was the beginning of that uh, uh, European uh, uh, colonization, which uh, of course was not, did not take place immediately, but it took place over time although some of the foundations of uh, the eventual uh, colonialism and colonization of the indigenous peoples were there, such as religion, religion, the Catholic religion, the Holy Roman Empire uh, became uh, part of uh, our indigenous uh, ancestors, our great, 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 great grandmothers and grandfathers. Mishu, Hama, Yunak, Katya, Kashait, many, many years back into the into the past. And of course, major changes came, you know, major changes, you know, because of uh, uh, really the uh, power of presence that the Europeans had upon the native population, not only in the Caribbean, but eventually into Mexico uh, by uh, uh, 1519 or so, uh, Cortez and uh, other uh, so-called conquistadors, you know, uh, overcame the native uh, indigenous population, and of course began to, uh, once they came into Mexico and overcame or conquered, quote unquote, uh, the population there of the. Uh, Aztec uh, people who were the uh, people uh, inhabiting or were the population of uh, uh, Mexico uh, at, at that time and uh, Tenochtitlan and the, which later became uh, the what is known as Mexico City. And so from there, you know, the, that was the capital of uh, the new world, you know, uh, in that part of the world, in that part of the uh, Americas. But eventually, you know, they began to look elsewhere, you know, to the south and to the north. And of course, the expeditions to the north, you know, uh, uh, took, began to take place in that, uh, in the 15, in the 1500s. It didn't take very long, just over a hundred years for, from discovery in 1490, uh, 1492 to 1598, when Juan de Oñate undertook to be the first uh, colonial um, um, uh, settler, you might call him, but he known as a conquistador you know, and he began to wreak many uh, forced changes. He wasn't very long, but then he was only one person. But his expedition that he uh, introduced and brought into our uh, indigenous lives and livelihood made the changes, especially through the religion that I spoke about, the Catholicism. 
And this became, you know, uh, very much a contentious uh, matter, religion, because as you know, uh, indigenous people depend upon a belief system which is powered by a religious and cultural uh, uh, understanding and the philosophy that's behind that uh, understanding. If our source of life is the earth and the uh, earth mother is and the concepts of that, uh, uh, of our identity is dependent on beliefs in that source, then there are going to be problems when the idea of God uh, as understood and taught and very forcefully by the priesthood and by the Holy Rom Roman Empire and the Pope and all of uh, the works uh, of that uh, religion, very powerful, uh, impactful uh, force because it was combined with what was happening in terms of their trade system, their economic power and what that meant to the um, rest of the European world and uh, the Spanish Empire was at the height of its uh, um, uh, of its of, of its uh, own uh, uh, way of uh, life and way of being and so the major source of uh, the the or the major result of that source of uh, understanding and way of being for the for that uh, uh, conquistador and the uh, uh, very rich and wealthy, powerful people back in Europe, in Spain, uh, impacted upon us so that we began to grow very much powerless and uh, without, uh, uh, say, recourse to much of anything except for ourselves. And Akama was one of the first uh, first uh, targets, you know, because of its uh, location atop this uh, sandstone uh, mesa. It's a large uh, sandstone mesa atop which the Pueblo was uh, located. Uh, the Pueblo, of course, it's a Spanish word. And that was adopted by within the, even the language system of the Ago Mehanotich, the Akama people. And so we found ourselves very much regarded as uh, not just tourist uh, items or tourist, uh, um, uh, whatever you call, to draw the uh, outsiders to us, to, to you, but because Akama and the defeat and the war upon the Akama people, the attack upon the Akama people, you know, took place almost uh, immediately after uh, Juan de Oñate uh, came to into the American Southwest, what is now the American Southwest, and and overcame and destroyed Acoma Pueblo and its people. Over 800 people were massacred or killed outright, and so that was really the first act of resistance. You know, in the uh, Americanist. Uh, North America uh, against the European um, invasion. And so I think that this is um, a, a, a source of uh, continued, uh, um, you could say agitation or continued uh, uh, inspiration and uh, model which uh, can still be taken uh, as a way to uh, have people uh, not regard ourselves only as uh, the ones who were overcome by the uh, powers of uh, conquest or powers of uh, uh, Europeans, but uh, also it gives us uh, uh, inspiration and bigger and, uh, you know, a goal to actually not only reclaim our land, but really reclaim ourselves in terms uh, mental and intellectual, artistic, and uh, uh, helping what I started with that 
uh, to protect our land, our air, our water, and to know that we uh, depend upon the original sources of our uh, belief system to be who we are. Ma hey uh, that is how we are able to claim ourselves, reclaim ourselves and our being. And we may use the word resistance. I know that it seems like a, a, um, a negative uh, word, but it's not. You know, to resist is to uh, resist against uh, uh, powers that are harmful and were and are and may be uh, harmful into the future if we don't do uh, what we need to do in uh, helping ourselves to become the self-sufficient and sustainable people and culture and community that we were. So that's what I'll say for, uh, for now. Thank you. And I have uh, a statement from Myris that if perhaps uh, I can read it at the end uh, yep. after the two, Jennifer Mar Marley and Jennifer Bennett Dale. <laughs> well, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ortiz. That was an incredibly uh, powerful and deep history. And of course, there's so much to touch on um, uh, with what you just said. Um, and so now I want to turn it over to uh, Dr. Jennifer Dennettdale, who is a citizen of the Navajo Nation, or Diné. Uh, she is a historian and a professor of American studies, also my colleague, <laughs> and also my PhD advisor and PhD chair, and the director of the University of New Mexico's Institute for American Indian Research, or IFAIR. She has served on the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission for nine years and served as its chair for four years from 2016 to 2020. She, rece she received her PhD in history from Northern Arizona University and, and is the author of three Navajo histories and numerous articles and essays. She is the first Diné uh, to receive a PhD in history. Her areas of expertise include critical indigenous studies Indigenous gender and sexuality, indigenous feminisms, and gender and Diné, uh, and Diné studies. She has received numerous awards that recognize her scholarship and community advocacy on behalf of Diné and indigenous women and indigenous LGBTQI2S uh, relatives. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Jennifer Denadale. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nick. I'm very pleased to be a part of this panel, to be here with the most distinguished um, Professor Simon Ortiz and the wonderful Jennifer Marley. I'm really grateful for, to be a part of this. Uh, Jennifer Danette Dell and Shia Ogan Shlon Ashihin Bashashin, Kilachitni Dashache, Tuahe, Klini Dashinala, Wat Ao Eya, Asan Shle. And so I just introduced myself in the Diné way as the Navajo woman. I'm here in Albuquerque in Tiwa territory. Um, and uh, I've been on the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission for 11 years now, I think. And I am served as a, a four-year term as chair. And I was just recently um, appointed, reappointed to the commission and am now serving as its current chair. And so I'm really proud of um, that work on behalf of the Navajo Nation. In terms of uh, the exhibit that this panel is a part of, I looked at the exhibit, I'm very pleased um, with the work that um, Nick Estes has done on that exhibit, uh, talking about the um, red power and how indigenous resistance um, is a tradition. Uh, my, one of the things that we had talked about in terms of my participating on this panel was to talk about border towns. And I grew up in Tohatchee, which is about 20 miles from Gallup, south of uh, Gallup, New Mexico. And so one of our traditions as Diné um, is always to have been have to go back, back and forth across this imaginary boundary between the Navajo Nation and set, uh, Hispanic and white settlements like 
um, Gallup, New Mexico, as well as other border towns like Cuba, New Mexico, Farmington, New Mexico, Winslow, Arizona. Um, and so our work um, as scholars and as um, being part of the community, um, my Navajo community and other indigenous communities um, is to really try, is to really question um, those kinds of boundaries that are set up like indigenous people are only belong on the reservation um, when actually all of what we live on is indigenous lands and that this movement back and forth between what is called the res and spaces like border towns and urban cities um, is a um, an imaginary um, boundary uh, that we every day um, raise critiques about because it just doesn't speak about the indigenous uh, experiences, um, especially under settler colonialism. Um, I was very young uh, when I began to recognize racism and discrimination, um, having grown up in and around um, Gallup, New Mexico. I remember as a child, I was about maybe 10 years old, and my mom and dad coming back from Gallup, and my mom very, very upset because my father had been arrested by the police in Gallup. Um, he'd gotten into a disagreement with um, one of, in one of the businesses uh, where he would go to make pay his bill. And the white woman became alarmed at this angry Indian man. And so the police were called, my mom didn't drive and she had to wait outside of the jail um, uh, for my dad until he got out. No charges were ever pressed against my father. And while my mom was just so upset about it, um, I was, I, I recognize the emotions now of being very proud of my father, <laughs> that um, he resisted racism and discrimination and he called it out and often um, had to pay a price uh, for it. And so it wasn't until I went to um, the University of New Mexico um, as an undergraduate um, and, I began to take, I took, those were the first places that I ever had native professors, one of them being um, Lucy Tabahanzo and the late Lewis Owens and being introduced to the works of someone like the distinguished Simon Ortiz. Those were my first experiences with um, indigenous writing, indigenous scholarship. Um, and their words, their language gave me a language to understand and to articulate. Um, what has always been indigenous resistance against incredible settler colonialisms of power, um, of violence um, of, against indigenous people that continues um, to this day. And so those early words um, of my actions and words of my father, and then the inspiration from our indigenous community and um, the scholarship of our uh, community-based uh, writers, poets, um, have always served as an inspiration for me to understand what was happening in these border towns. Um, these border towns where indigenous people and especially Navajo people in a place like Gallup um, continue to be treated as disempowered subjects, um, as people who are in the lower echelons uh, of their structure, uh, even though they exist because of indigenous resources. And so based upon that, um, early uh, or the, uh, a growing consciousness about uh, border town and border town violence. I, um, I just saw an uh, a call for commissioners for the NAV, uh, interim commissioner for the human rights commission and I applied never really thinking that I would be um, selected. I was selected for a one year interim position. Um, and was appointed by the Navajo Nation Human Rights, um, Navajo Nation Council, excuse me. And so, you know, the, the council, the, um, the Navajo Nation Human Rights Council was established um, after a Navajo man, Clint John, was killed by a white police officer in Farmington. And as um, the exhibit that Nick has put together in his own work, as well as um, Jennifer's and um, Simon Ortiz's work um, indicates that these places like uh, these border towns are just like full of anti-Indianism and that Indian hating is a tradition um, in these spaces. Um, I was very young um, 
when I was aware of what they call the Choke Cherry Massacre, when three white high school Farmington boys um, tortured and mutilated three Navajo men. One of them was um, married to one of my dad's uh, nieces. My dad was from Fruitland, New Mexico. And I remember the, el the, the, the elders or the, the parents, my parents um, and uh, my dad's relatives sitting at the table and talking about what had happened. And so um, that's in the 19, 1970s. And then we have here um, in, the, in 2000, and 2021, 2016 was when um, the Navajo Nation Human Rights uh, uh, Commission was established. And it was in response to the killing of Clint John by the, in Farmington by the white police officer. And so the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission is one, um, is unique uh, because it is the only entity of any, Navajo, of any native nation um, within the United States. Uh, and the, the work is, um, sometimes it can be very refreshing and inspiring uh, because we network and we try to address these issues, these, first of all, uh, these um, complaints of uh, racism and discrimination that Navajo citizens experience in these border towns and in these um, urban spaces. Uh, but we also have the capability to um, bring a lawsuit um, and other kinds of actions um, against entities that are practicing racism and discrimination against Navajo citizens. Um, the work, um, it, it takes, a, and also the protection of sacred sites. For example, we've worked um, for years um, trying to uh, protect uh, San Francisco's peak, um, the Sleet. Um, from the kind of desecration that Snowball um, does there and continues to do. In fact, it um, is at this moment um, expanding its parking lot. Uh, so uh, that kind of work on behalf of Navajo citizens um, invokes indigenous people's rights as well as Diné fundamental law. Um, and uh, Nick mentioned uh, what um, Simon, I mean, Sam, um, Vine Deloria talked about in terms of um, you think ahead, you think seven generations um, in terms of always preparing your people for the for the present and for the and for the future. And so I think about that in terms of the invocation of Diné fundamental law and the Diné teachings, and that is a part of the work that we do on behalf of the Navajo Nation that, um, and as Simon said at the end here, he, he brings up the point about um, remembering the origi our original instructions, remembering our relationships to each other. And that is what the Nef Fundamental Law is about as well, is that um, against these structures of settler violence that we have to deal with and struggle with, we always remember the core principles of who we are as indigenous peoples and as Diné. And these are the original instructions that are brought to us through prayer, through song, through ceremony, and then become our practices as relations to each other, relations to the mother earth, relations to the father sky, relations to all beings. Um, and that's what I think is so crucial about the kind of work that indigenous people, community-based, um, uh, people, our uh, educators, our grandparents um, do is because we remember those lessons brought to us uh, by our ancestors. And so thank you very much. Um, I'm pleased to be a part of this panel. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jennifer Denetil. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Jennifer Marley, who is a PhD student in the American Studies Department at the University of New Mexico. Uh, Jennifer entered the program having completed a BA with a double major in Native American Studies and American Studies in 2019. Uh, her research interests include queer Indigenous studies, Indigenous feminisms, third world feminisms, uh, Indigenous political movements, Marxism, internationalism, environmental studies, critical Indigenous studies, and settler colonialism. Influenced by her upbringing as a citizen of San Ildefonso Pueblo, uh, Jennifer's research explores the unique ways heteropatriarchy has manifested in public communities and how this shapes and reshapes public identity and kinship, as well as relationships to the state and other groups. 
In particular, uh, Jennifer is interested in articulating a Pueblo, uh, Puebla and Publex feminist lens and contributing to the theoretical frameworks indigenous feminism have produced. So I'll turn it over to Jennifer Marley. Thank you, Nick. Ubi agendi na kawe Jennifer Marley na vite wa kawe po na po geoinge ota. I'm from the Pueblo of San Alfonso, and um, my grandmother is also from Sia Pueblo. I'm from the Coyote Clan, Shrutu na Hanusuta. Um, excuse me, as I'm still learning my Karis language. Um, I I'm gonna talk a little bit today about. Um, I'm, what, what I'm going to do today is offer a critique first of um, the art industry and the museum industry and how it has historically played a role in the shaping of Pueblo identity. And then I'm going to talk about um, how that relates to the current movements we're seeing challenging revisionist history and racist monuments. And um, finally, I'll end by talking about how um, the articulations of Pueblo feminism and indigenous feminisms that um, young organizers and activists have put forth um, intervene in these conversations. So um, pardon me as I'm gonna be reading a little bit off my notes, um, but yeah, so I'll start from my perspective. So I come from an art family. Um, again, uh, my grandmother's from Sia Pueblo and my grandfather's from San Alfonso Pueblo where I'm enrolled now. And um, from the late 70s through the mid 90s, um, they maintained um, a status of notoriety within the Indian art world, um, participating in, of course, the Indian market. So I had Indian market and um, the Herd show for a number of years. And um, during that time, um, they acquired a significant amount of wealth. And what I'm interested in thinking about is how um, the art industry and the museum industry um, actually function as an extractive industry um, with the extraction of not only native art and culture, but of native wealth and life. So I ask, what was the cost of being represented in the upper echelons of the art world for my family? I recall my grandmother and aunts being especially patient with tourists and spectators who would pry for sensitive cultural information or make patronizing or infantilizing remarks about our family and at worst treat us like living artifacts that exist for their entertainment as if us existing in our pueblos were like a living museum. The livelihood of our family depended on making these pottery sales, even if it meant participating in the commodification of our culture and performing cultural authenticity to appease the white gaze that sought the exotic. I would come to find out that family friends who are among um, the many buyers of my grandmother's pottery um, and those who wel we welcomed into our home for feast days made their fortunes as oil mongols, museum directors, and scientists at Los Alamos National Labs. Those who are directly implicated and even made their living off of our death and exploitation of our lands. Um, the fact that my mother grew up relatively wealthy during the height of um, my grandparents' career contrasted against the fact that I grew up relatively impoverished, which I didn't realize until my adulthood, I think highlights the extractive nature of the Indian art industry. The very consumers of our art don't care to see our suffering, only our feathers and our beautiful creations. The very consumers of our art, the distance that my grandparents' career created between us and our Pueblo core values is apparent. Our relationship to money and our understanding of wealth would become transformed by the capitalist mindset that the art industry had instilled. I, and so what I challenge the audience to do is to look beyond the superficial charm um, and beauty of New Mexico and instead consider what the cost of producing and maintaining such a rich and beautiful regional culture is and how it's implicated in racial capitalism and global imperialism. Um, so meanwhile, as you know, New Mexico continues to be known for um, its production of culture, indigenous people continue to have the lowest quality of life here, suffering the highest rates of poverty, addiction, violence, both on and off the reservation, as Dr. Danette Dell just mentioned in depth. 
while the wealthy continue to live in leisure on stolen lands, enjoying outdoor attractions, native art and culture. So I ask, what role do aesthetics, visual culture and literature in New Mexico play in reinforcing the inevitability of indigenous disappearance? So much of New Mexico's visual culture makes a spectacle of indigenous art and culture, yet native people themselves are denied access to their own lands, be it in the art mecca of Santa Fe or at the site of the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos. I argue that New Mexico's economy is actually dependent on the art and tourism industry alongside gas, oil, and the extraction of um, uranium um, while it is simultaneously dependent on indigenous disappearance um, and indigenous death. Um, so I want to kind of go over briefly the history of the Indian art industry and its relation to racist monuments and celebrations. Um, so um, many people might be familiar with my involvement in um, the protest to abolish the racist entrada. So I want to talk about um, the origins of the racist entrada to um, the, and its relation to the museum industry. So it was in 1922 that the Indian Fair, which would come to be known later as a Swai Indian market, was created by the Museum of New Mexico as a part of the Santa Fe Fiesta celebration. A celebration that included the notorious celebration of genocide known as the Entrada, which is a reenactment that depicted a revisionist account of the brutal reconquest of Santa Fe by Don Diego de Vargas. Um, it came to be known as the bloodless reconquest, which is anything but true, um, being that there at the side of the plaza, over 80 Pueblo warriors from, who participated in the Pueblo revolt were hung soon after, and their wives and children then distributed to de Vargas's men as slaves. The Museum of New Mexico and School of American Research board members were entirely non-native and Western educated. These outsiders led by the much heralded grave robber Edgar Lee Hewitt added elements, added elements to the entrada and the museum to make it more appealing to white tourists and visitors to Santa Fe. Hewitt, a well-known anthropologist, was known for unlawfully excavating remains and artifacts from holy Pueblo sites and even trespassing into Pueblo residential homes without consent. Hewitt and his ilk also romanticized the colonial Spanish era through the creation of the contemporary entrada with images of Catholic and military glory from a bygone era. According to Swaya's own website, in 1919, museum director Lee Hewitt had revived the fiesta as an annual celebration to help promote tourism. His inclusion in the Indian fair and the fiesta pageant was reminiscent of the world fairs and in particular the San Diego's ex the San Diego Exposition's anthropological exhibits and the Santa Fe Railway's living exhibition titled The Painted Desert. Um, this particular world fair, mind you, placed Pueblo Indians in human zoos as exhibits. Um, and I remember seeing those pictures of um, potters from my Pueblo San Aldefonso and these um, man-made zoos with these like fake mud homes. And I just couldn't believe that that's not more um, talked about in terms of our history and our involvement in the art industry. Um, and I also think that those snapshots are reminiscent of Pueblo people selling their crafts under the portal at the Palace of the Governors in Santa Fe. Um, being photographed by tourists to capture this time period, marking the beginning of the tourism industry. To this day, native artists are made to sit on the ground under that portal to sell their crafts, to keep intact this nostalgic image, once again, attempting to relegate indigenous people to the past and only in the past are they able to exist. Um, Meanwhile, walking vendors on the Santa Fe Plaza are subjected to police violence, jail time, and fines for not paying that hefty fee to sit under the portal as a living artifact, or refusing to sell their wares to the predatory museums and galleries lining the plaza, who refuse to pay full price for native art, but then mark it up to three times its purchase price. Museums, galleries, and pawn shops are the physical manifestations of these predatory industries that have always depended on native suffering, impoverishment, desperation, and death to sustain themselves. 
Yet many of these artists hold on to their pride and dignity and actively engage in the refusal to protect culturally sensitive information and avert the degrading gaze of those who consume their art. What is often overlooked, however, is the experiences, attitudes, and feelings of these native artisans, even as we critique the institutions that facilitate their exploitation. Um, so I, I think it's this refusal that native artists are now, native artists and native people in general are now engaging in, that's actually calling on us to remind, to remember these very racist roots of um, the art, tourism, and museum industry in New Mexico. And um, these, those industries um, are absolutely responsible for um, creating a lot of the narratives that are popular in New Mexico today that glorify the genocide of Pueblo people, the Spanish colonial violence, and um, later US occupation today. So um, as I entered the university at um, UNM, I came into contact with the Red Nation. And the very first um, event I went to was a screening of a film called Nuclear Savage, um, which was about the way atomic bombs were tested by the indigenous Marshallese people at Bikini Atoll. And I immediately made the connection between the establishment and creation of the first atomic bomb on my ancestral lands. Um, and so very soon um, I would come to realize that there was, this was a long ongoing movement. Um, I was not new to it and neither were any of us, but I would come to learn later that um, the Entrada had been being protested since at least um, 1980 um, and that there was precedent for this type of Pueblo activism. And I was excited um, to learn more about it and to continue these traditions of resistance myself. Um, so one of the very first um, campaigns that um, the Red Nation um, created was the campaign to instill Indigenous Peoples Day, um, followed by the campaign to abolish UNM's racist seal. And we understood that movement as being in tandem with these um, efforts nationally, whether it be the abolition of the Confederate flag or the abolition of Harvard's racist seal, which depicted the seal of a slave owning family. Um, and this would actually lead to a series of campaigns that were also focused on um, the abolition of racist imagery um, that reinforces um, the celebration of genocide here. So after our victory uh, with the abolition of the seal, which only barely this year is it actually being removed, and this, this began in 2015, um, we would see that campaign spill over to um, the campaign to abolish the Entrada, which we first got involved with in 2016, um, after people who were formerly a part of the reenactment themselves had decided to protest after um, you know, realizing what it was actually doing. Um, and then from that, we would see um, nationwide people contesting these racist monuments. Um, this year, we saw the removal of two statues of Oñate, um, known for his, you know, as, as Dr. Ortiz just mentioned, notorious crimes against the people of Acoma. And um, he was actually one of the only conquistadors to be to, taken back to Spain in shackles and charged by the Spanish crown for his brutality. And only in New Mexico here is he celebrated. Um, and it's because of these narratives that have been reinforced by the museum and the art industry historically. And um, in response to this pushback against revisionist history and anti-Indian racism, uh, we actually saw um, pushback from that from um, people who identify as Hispano, people who identify um, with, um, with Spanish conquest. And so um, we also understand that this pushback exists in relation to the broader um, white supremacist violence that we're now seeing take place all throughout the US. Um, and it is especially intensified um, you know, within the past few years or at least become more visible, right? Um, so 
we hear these Nazis, right, chant the phrase blood and soil and you will not replace us. Um, and scholars have pointed out, such as Jody Bird, that you will not replace us is the rallying cry of settler imperialists who move to displace indigenous people who destroy us in order to replace us. Um, in addition to its roots in the terrorization of black life, white supremacy has always operated according to the genocidal logic of destroy to replace. Um, and we know that this anti-black racism that we've seen manifest in the multiple police shootings just within the past year alone and the genocide of indigenous existence also known as settler colonialism are the twin pillars of white supremacy and they're at the heart of these gatherings that we're seeing um, today and that are being threatened at the inauguration um, and they're indeed the heart of settler nationalism so there's these undeniable parallels to what we're seeing at the national level with the mobilization of these white supremacists and uh, those who are reacting um, to the removal of um, racist um, Spanish monuments that celebrate genocide. Um, and there's a reason why these efforts to abolish white supremacist holidays like Columbus Day, Thanksgiving, monuments, statues, and university seals have been met with this type of opposition. That's because these monuments, these reenactments, and these symbols represent ideological attachments to the status quo. And that status quo in the US is white supremacy. And as we saw this past summer horrifically, its proponents are willing to kill to preserve it. Um, during the abolish the racist seal campaign, we experienced numerous attacks from people that claimed we were erasing their history. Um, and what we continue to see today is what exactly happens um, when these white supremacists or Hispano nationalists um, decide to kill and harm and harass to keep intact these symbols that are so precious to them that in some cases they even liken to our own ceremonies as Pueblo people or indigenous people. So, now I'm going to shift gears a little and I'm wrapping up um, to talk about Pueblo feminism, to talk about land, and to talk about um, how we envision generative possibilities moving forward. So an example of how the tourism industry operates today is um, by the creation of these resorts on sacred land. So I'm going to be talking about Ojo Caliente which is a world famous resort and spa located north of Española um, at a place which was once known as Pocio Winge, derived from the word Pocio meaning green in reference to the color of the rocks around the hot springs there. And um, in reference to a Pueblo cultural hero and deity who was invoked during the Pueblo revolt. Um, so, there's an examples of places like Ojo Caliente and then also um, Los Alamos National Labs, where, which was established in the Jemez Mountains near the Bandelier Na National Monument, our cliff dwellings. They have even been contaminated since. And um, so there's this very clear link between the tourism industry and what we what is made into tourist attractions and um, you know, the, the theft of land and desecration of land and life. So I'm gonna finish up here um, and just talk real briefly about our articulation of Pueblo feminism. Um, so it's undeniable that these recent movements against um, these celebrations of genocide have been led by young Pueblo women and other indigenous women. Um, and so, the, the Pueblo Feminist Caucus, who I'm a proud co-founder of, um, we center, we center um, the experiences of Native youth and Native non-men um, because of the way um, historically heteropatriarchy has been instilled in our cultures to um, erase our feminine deities and to erase the roles of women historically. Um, and I'm just gonna read a little excerpt from uh, one of our first, our very first um, articulations of Pueblo feminism here. And it says, 
Traditionally, caretaking was and still is the responsibility of many fam family members within our larger networks of kin. Um, not limited to taking care of children, but we caretake our elders, our partners, we caretake the seeds we plant, we caretake the land, we caretake our animal relatives, and we caretake our sacred sites. Queer Indigenous feminism asks us to expand our ideas about what counts as caretaking and who is a caretaker. It doesn't matter what your gender is, it doesn't matter if you speak your language fluently, what matters is how you act. Are you a good relative? That's the only question queer Indigenous feminists ask ourselves and ask of our comrades. So I leave the audience today with two questions. Um, exhibits like this one highlight our precious histories of resistance and remind us that these traditions are not only relegated to the past, but ongoing today. So what are the generative possibilities for museums to empower Native people and our traditions of resistance in a place like New Mexico, where historically they've served to uphold violent revisionist history and the glorification of genocide. Um, I mean this question seriously because although I'm very critical of um, the museum, I see this exhibit as an example of countering that. So thank you so much. Thanks so much, uh, Jen, you covered a lot of ground. Um, so unfortunately, uh, Morris Chino, who was invited to participate in this panel, wasn't able to make it um, due to some unforeseen circumstances. So I'm going to read his bio and then uh, Simon, Dr. Simon Ortiz is going to read a short statement on behalf of, um, of Mars Chino. So Mars Chino is of the Eagle Sun Clan at Acoma Pueblo. He was born in Albuquerque in 1954, attended the Grants New Mexico High School and New Mexico State University. His career has been as a forest fighter, a forest fighter, a for, excuse me, a forest firefighter a teacher, a minor, illustrator, art consultant, full-time painter, and when time permits, a potter. And also he, he has a, a piece on the Pueblo Revolt that's actually featured in the exhibit it, itself. So I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Simon uh, Ortiz to read a statement on his behalf. Okay, thank you. I shall read this on behalf of uh, uh, my nephew, Maris Chino. Greetings, everyone, and Happy New Year. I'm honored to be here to help speak uh, about Indigenous resistance. I appreciate the venue the Albuquerque Museum has provided through the exhibit Seven Generations of Red Power in New Mexico. I like that title. It means the people were never acquiescent to the violent subjugation that happened at the hands of the so-called Spanish conquistadors. It means that the people have always held an inherent sacred power to retain our land, culture, and religious beliefs. It means that the people were never conquered. We never became dark-skinned minor mirror images of the Spanish invaders. Our resistance is the reason we are still here. It is important to note that the resistance to the Spanish invasion here in New Mexico began almost immediately. It was a mere six months after the butcher Juan de Oñate uh, crossed what today is the Rio Grande in Southern New Mexico, that violent confrontation with the uh, Spanish began. My culture, our, uh, my Acoma people from earlier confrontations knew the uh, education, the uh, situation was and that they're to, to be free, uh, that our lives, our culture and our very existence were in mortal danger. The people rose to violent resistance. There was no other alternative. And for defending the land and the people, Aku was nearly destroyed in a battle that raged three days in the bitter winter of 1599. The massacre of over 800 
800 Akamas men, women, and children was meant as a lesson for other indigenous city states. Juan de Oñate, may he stay in hell where he belongs, was not the only Spanish who came to the northern frontier to what is now New Mexico. There were others who cast greedy eyes on the new lands. Coronado, among others, had, had arrived here before Oñate and wrecked, uh, and wrecked havoc among the peoples and the city states along the Rio Grande. They were never, they were never benign explorers. Their invasion was always uh, about greed, greed for the land and resources and greed for the very souls of the people. The Catholic church is culpable. The church was never accepted who has never accepted its role in the attempted genocide of the people. Cultural and religious genocide is every bit as devastating as blood spilt from swords, cannons, muskets, and attack dogs trained to eat human flesh. During the dark years, 1591 to 1628, Two thirds of the indigenous people in New Mexico perished from Spanish violence. And of the over 90 original indigenous city states, only 19 have survived to this day. The tragedy of genocide here in the American Southwest was the same as in Central and South America, differing only to different only in sheer scale. Entire tribes and cultures were vanished forever. Our lives on the reservations were affected by many of the government programs meant to erase us later on after the Spanish. McCarty Day School, one of the governmental school, schools at Acoma worked worked as its brainwashing on our young minds. We pledged allegiance to the American flag and sang the stars bangled, bangled banner with all our younger young hearts. On Friday afternoons, we were required to learn the Catholic catechism from nuns dressed in traditional gowns and habits. We were as young children, we were affected by Indian Relocations Act of the 1950s. My cousins with their mother and father moved to Cleveland, Ohio. Their father, after learning the welding trade, moved the family back to Acoma. They were the fortunate ones, they were rooted firmly to the land. The intent to remove Indian people from their homelands and, had, and become part of the mainstream of American society worked. And sadly, some never returned and some even today return only occasionally strangers in their own homeland. In 1972, I attended Haskell Indian Junior College. The AIM takeover at Wounded Knee had just happened and some of the activists were laying low in, on campus. I remember talking to Larry Anderson. He spoke quickly, quietly about revolution. I listened, but didn't have much, uh, but, I wasn't much affected by what was happening in Indian country. I wonder about that now. I wonder what made me mean, um, made me not want to act. In 1992, something happened that changed my life. I read a story in the newspaper of a statue to Juan de Oñate 
The story affected me at the gut level. The rage of intergenerational repression rose up inside of me. I could not sit by and do nothing. I began to write letters which were largely ineffective. They seemingly changed nothing. I hadn't made any difference. The first statue of Oñate went up in Alcalde, New Mexico, northern part of the state. The change came within myself. I began to organize. I founded the Southwest Indigenous Alliance. I had no idea what I was doing, but I learned from other activists who helped me as I went along. And this is the timeline of, uh, of uh, some of the uh, SWAYAs, uh, Southwest uh, Alliance, Indigenous Alliance. In 1994, he founded Southwest Indigenous Alliance, started to organize symposiums and conferences. 2003, first action for SWIA to protest Hornada Monument at Albuquerque Museum. That was uh, the, the point was the statue of uh, Juan de Oñate, the so-called conquistador. 2004, presented foot of power, a hand sculpted clay foot representing the right foot of Acoma warriors after the battle of Acoma in uh, 1599. Uh, he gave it as a donation to Mayor Marty Chavez of the city of Albuquerque. Uh, Marius is an uh, artist and sculptor. 2004, Swaya makes a trip to southern Mexico, Chiapas, to, in solidarity with the Zapatista movement, commemorating the 10-year anniversary of the 1994 Zapatista uprising in Chiapas, uh, Mexico. 2005, protest at the Albuquerque Museum on Veterans Day to protest uh, conquistador, um, the war, the conquistador war machine in solidarity with veterans for peace. 2005 and 2006, visited tribal leaders throughout New Mexico, Navajo Nation and Hopi Nation to seek tribal support to oppose Albuquerque Tricentennial. 2005, protested at Albuquerque Public Library. It was the first major confrontation with John Hauser, sculptor of uh, Oñate Equestrian Monument in El Paso, Texas and a Hispanic Cultural Preser Preservation League, which is in uh, Santa Fe and, and Albuquerque. 2004, a protest at the Albuquerque Conservatives Convention Center to oppose the visit of Spain's Duke of Albuquerque, Arabuqueque, as we called it at Acaba, to New Mexico from Spain in preparation for Albuquerque's tricentennial. We were outnumbered by the police by three times. 2007, pro protest at the El Paso airport uh, with uh, others from Isleta uh, Pueblo del Sur tribe, which is in El Paso, east of the city of El Paso and Chicano allies from El Paso, Texas, uh, Texas. So those are the things that, uh, items that uh, Myrus wanted me to present on his behalf. Thank you. And thank you to Usana uh, Myrus. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Simon Ortiz for reading that. I just want to reflect briefly on some of the things that were brought up in this discussion, because it was very wide ranging. And first of all, it's to say that um, this exhibit, because of the certain limitations of having a virtual exhibit, we couldn't include everything. And that's why I invited all of these panelists to fill in those gaps and to expand and extrapolate on, um, on uh, some of the things that were in there and some of the things that weren't in there. 
And I'm, I really appreciate that uh, Maris provided a timeline of all of those events because it's it's incredibly important. Another thing uh, that um, Jennifer uh, Jennifer Marley touched on um, is the function and the role of you know public art as well as public education in the form of museums. And one of the most potent forms of you know history as it's told in in the mainstream kind of media, but also in mainstream education is something that archeologist Michael Wilcox calls terminal narratives, narratives, which are the obsession with death, disappearance and the absence of indigenous people rather than their continued visible presence and challenge to colonialism, which I think each of the, the speakers uh, really spoke to. And the most, you know, the most obvious example of this tendency are historical models that assign blame for the mass killing of indigenous people to invisible forces such as diseases or germs, right? And I think in this particular moment in time, we can, we can look to what we're currently facing as the pandemic and look to how uh, narratives, uh, narrative shifts that the Red Power Movement uh, you know, proliferated help us understand this particular moment. And just to kind of reflect and build on what um, everyone in this panel has said so far, you know, Native nations have been the hardest hit by the coronavirus, as we all know, especially in the Southwest and especially in New Mexico. The Navajo Nation, whose lands helped make the United States the world's largest oil producer, now faces some of the, uh, has faced some of the worst rates of infection and death, not only compared to other states, but to entire countries. Almost 30% of uh, its reservation population lives without running water and about 10% lives without electricity. While coal from the Navajo Nation fuels power plants and the water from its river soaks golf courses in Phoenix, Arizona. And the United States, as Jennifer Marley brought up, created the first nuclear bomb on, sacred, on a sacred Tewa Mesa with uranium mined from Navajo lands, poisoning generations of people. So for, Na for the Navajo and Pueblo people in this state, the real pandemic is, and, as, and always has been, resource col uh, colonization. And what we now know, you know, as uh, modern day police violence also has its roots, as, as Jennifer Marley pointed out, as, and as well as Dr. Simon Ortiz pointed out, you know, it's important to note that the first frontier police in the United States were the scalp hunters recruited into Indian country to murder Apaches in the 1840s and the 1850s. Churches in Santa Fe once ran the scalps of Apaches up on their flagpoles. And this, you know, for my people, from my perspective as a, as a Dakota, Lakota person in Minnesota, settlers collected scalp bounties on Dakota men, women, and children um, in, 18, in 1862. Frontier newspapers advertised land for sale alongside rewards for bloody quote unquote redskins the violence, of settler, uh, the violence of the settler has always been understood as productive, progressive, and thus lawful, and thus correct, right? And so we, we can understand like how not only um, uh, art, but also how public history tends to, tends to re can reinforce those narratives, but also creates a space where we can challenge those narratives, right? And we, we see how those narratives have been challenged. And I think each presenter has brought up uh, the, the various ways and, you know, the, the changing of sports mascots, the toppling of, of uh, colonizer statues, but that happened not just because it was the right thing to do or people's minds had been changed, people in power who had the, you know, as, as Morris pointed out, had decades to change these things, didn't do so, but it came at, at the behest of, of uh, movements led by indigenous people. So I think that's incredibly important to remember and to reflect upon. Um, I have, I have uh, uh, several questions and we don't have uh, a lot of time, but I do wanna ask uh, the first question uh, to Dr. Jennifer Dennettdale. I would like you to uh, briefly explain um, because my first encounter with the Red Power Movement actually came through uh, the legacy of Larry Casus and also reading the Farmington Report, which was you know detailed the Choke Cherry Massacres. Uh, it was a response to that as well. And so I was wondering if you could uh, briefly touch upon uh, the importance of a figure like Larry Casus and his role in, in Red Power um, in the past, but also in the struggles today for indigenous people. Oh, you're on mute. 
Uh, I grew up in Tohatchi, New Mexico, which is maybe, I don't know, eight, nine miles from um, Larry Casusa's home community of Mexican Springs. Um, I was 11 or 12 years old um, when Larry and um, Robert Nakadene took the mayor of Gallup hostage because that was the only thing that they saw that was finally left to do in their objections to the way that Gallup treated um, its indigenous and primarily its Navajo people in terms of just keeping a alcohol soaked environment, uh, which always resulted in dead Indians and dead Navajos. Uh, and so I was just a, a young person, 11 or 12, and I was aware of um, the shooting of Larry Casus by Gallup police. Um, I was aware of um, the Navajo community becoming incensed at the treatment of Larry's body in the aftermath of his killing um, and just the widespread protests that happened throughout the schools um, during that time. But I was, I was very young and I did understand what was, what was happening at that time. And it really was um, the Kiva Club, I think, that um, reminded us, the, the Indigenous community, the Navajo community of um, Larry's sacrifice. Uh, they held several um, uh, uh, memorials, um, several uh, teach-ins to remind us of Larry Casus's um, sacrifice on behalf of his people. And I think that that um, resistance and that um, standing up for Indigenous people, which took Larry's life, um, has been a, has been a reminder to our people that these struggles are five more than five hundred years old, and that Indigenous people continue um, to be here and to continue to re resist in um, multiple ways. And so, um, after that, I also became aware of, after I started reading about. Um, what had happened in Gallup, and I knew about what had happened in Gallup in Farmington because of my my father's um, relatives who had talked about it at the kitchen table. Um, I then became aware of John Redhouse's work and found John to be just this incredible, brilliant person who worked relentlessly on behalf of his people. Um, um, at one time, becoming a, a, a community organizer and advocating on behalf of his people, refusing the hate of, against indigenous people and Navajo people in Farmington um, in the aftermath of the what they call the Choke, Ch Choke Cherry Massacre, to then read um, John's work and just see what an incredible strategist he is, how brilliant he is, and that um, their work and their um, their mindset and their energy was always about resistance to um, the settler and the settlers' um, insistence that we are beholden to them and that we have nothing to offer. Uh, and so I became inspired um, by those readings and I actually emailed, found John's email and emailed him. And after that, we, became, we began to correspond and he sent me more of his work and his readings. Uh, and so that's how I became more acquainted or, or began to realize a little bit more about um, the struggles during the Red, Red Power Movement and then becoming aware of present day struggles of indigenous people, particularly in border towns, meeting Nick and, um, Nick, um, and Melanie Yassi and um, their work through the Red Nation, which was also, um, motivated by uh, another brutal um, mutilation and torture of two Navajo men, um, Key Thompson and Allison um, Gorman, who were, uh, who were murdered here in Albuquerque, you know? And so um, the work continues inspiration and the determination that we don't just stand by and we haven't just stood by that resistance takes different kinds of, of, of um, there's layers of, of resistance. Um, that continues um, to the present. Thank you. Um, and the second question that I have is for Dr. Simon Ortiz. You were an active participant in the Red Power Movement uh, in its early days here in Albuquerque and in the Southwest. Um, and, and in fact, John Redhouse, uh, who Jennifer, Dr. Jennifer Denadale just mentioned, 
uh, pointed out uh, that he was misidentified in one of the pictures that we have in the exhibit and that it's actually you <laughs> who are featured in the exhibit. Um, and it was, it was when you were in the offices of the uh, National Indian Youth Council uh, as an editor uh, for Americans Before Columbus, which was the NAYC newsletter at the time. And I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about uh, your role in NAYC and the Red Power Movement during that particular time. Well, I was uh, with NIYC from 1970 uh, onward. Of course, I knew about uh, NIYC National Indian Youth Council before because uh, you mentioned uh, Clyde Warrior's uh, name uh, a while ago, and uh, he was actually the uh, leader. He was uh, from, uh, uh, from Oklahoma, and he was, uh, I think, uh, maybe during his college years that uh, NIO, NIOIC uh, you know, be, be formed. And uh, I was uh, in high school uh, by then. I didn't know much about it until really 19, uh, you know, in Gallup when he was forming. And I had just newly finished high school in May of 1960. And so I had gone to the uh, Gallup Indian ceremonial which used to take place <laughs> in Gallup. And it was uh, sponsored by the Gallup and the mayor and the uh, city fathers and so forth. And of course, it was uh, really an exploitation of uh, Native American or indigenous culture. And they would uh, have uh, performances done to show what Indians, uh, uh, Indian expression, you know, at the time, of course, the term uh, was very strong and still is a, um, Indian in, in this or Indian that and Indian uh, uh, stereotypes, you know, and of course that was uh, what the focus was upon, you know, the so-called honoring of uh, Indian people and culture and art and so forth, you know, but it was actually money-making, you know, and uh, Gallup, New Mexico is a border town, a big border town, you know, where many of the indigenous peoples locally, you know, the uh, Zuni uh, Pueblo Reservation is to the south of Gallup and of course uh, uh, the northern and western and eastern uh, borders of the, uh, uh, of the city of Gallup and McKinley County, which is uh, the of which uh, Gallup is uh, the main city within that you know uh, area. It's surrounded by Tenet, uh, the Tene, uh, the Navajo Nation uh, people, you know, and of course east of there is uh, is uh, Ankh or Akama, about uh, seventy five miles or so to the east, and so uh, the Gallup Indian ceremony was. Uh, um, a money-making uh, thing that uh, uh, in non-indigenous people, you know, would put together annually since when and who knows when uh, uh, it would end. Well, actually, there was a protest for years against that kind of uh, exploitation of a Native American uh, ceremonial and uh, uh, events uh, and uh, a proper respecting and honoring of uh, indigenous um, uh, peoples, you know, uh, and of course, New Mexico is uh, originally nothing but the indigenous people until later in 1590s and uh, onward, you know, there were other people who came uh, to there to uh, uh, be a part of that uh, Gallup Indian ceremony when it and ever it be, it began. Well, in 1960s and um, 1970s was after after I had finished high school and went to college. I worked first worked for the uh, uranium mining and refining industry. You know, right out of high school, there was a job, and we as indigenous peoples in the area, you know, especially pueblos and the Navajo Nation people men and boys were hired easily because of uh, uh, we didn't have much skills, uh, you know, except um, some years in high school and uh, grade school and so forth. Of course, we spoke uh, English and understood, you know, uh, the time and working and uh, 
we uh, put our backs and uh, arms and hands and feet to work, you know, as cheap labor. And so we were exploited for, the, for, for what uh, physical powers we had. And so I knew firsthand, you know, the oppression, you know, that uh, wage labor uh, is. And on indigenous land, Laguna Pueblo had been forced to open the uh, jack pile uranium mine, the first open pit and the biggest open pit uranium mine on Laguna Pueblo land. Mm -hmm. Laguna Pueblo is just right next to east, uh, east of our border is Kawaika, uh, uh, you know, the lake people or uh, uh, Laguna, which is also, of course, Lake Laguna in Spanish. And so, uh, we knew that uh, oppression. And so when I joined later uh, the uh, NIYC, uh, which was uh, headquartered in that time, at that time in Albuquerque, New Mexico, I uh, had this uh, uh, firsthand experience of working for the man, you know, Kerr McGee, uh, Kermac uh, refinery in, in Ambrosia Lake, which is, uh, uh, you know, part or originally part of the uh, Navajo Navajo Nation, and even uh, of course uh, uh, the Navajo people were employed there. You know, people from Pruitt, you know, which is right next to uh, Milan, uh, which is next to Grant, New Mexico, in the McKinley County and Valencia County. The cheap labor was all indigenous people. And of course, Mexican American people in San Rafael and San Mateo and in Grant itself. And so we were all part of that swarm or swamp of uh, um, exploitable land and resources along with the uranium. And so when I went to work for, uh, work with, uh, um, uh, NIYC, I was the uh, uh, editor of uh, the newspaper, ABC, Americans Before Columbus, you know, because I knew the people and of course uh, I was, uh, you know, um, somewhat uh, well experienced from not only being in college at Fort Lewis in Durango, Colorado, and then later joined the uh, army because I was disgusted with college because it was teaching me nothing except what the American education uh, felt I should learn to be uh, uh, not just cheap labor but a cheap office worker maybe or something. I wanted to be a chemist you know at that, at that time many years ago and I, in fact I even majored in chemistry at Fort Lewis College and later on at uh, no, that was it, you know, three semesters of college for me and I was disgusted with college and so I left and joined something even more dumber, which was the United States Army. And after I came back from, uh, uh, from the discharge from the army, I was, uh, um, I, I went to begin college again at UNM, University of New Mexico. Anyway, being a, newspaper editor really with this uh, activist organization NIYC you know um, National Indian News Council I think uh, gave me a real look because we worked with uh, indigenous peoples through the Pueblos and uh, like uh, Tezuki Pueblo which was undergoing a uh, land issue where uh, this outside corporation was wanted to use and uh, use uh, some of the land for its uh, golf course and also at Cochin de Pueblo where a lake was built and the Great Western was a uh, um, uh, housing development and uh, the Pueblo people did not want to just be uh, standing by as the federal government which is BI Bureau of Indian Affairs was going to sign the papers and so they came to us as NIYC and we held uh, protests and uh, uh, prevented to some degree just uh, uh, American corporations to take over the land. And there was other land issues in Arizona and um, 
uh, NIYC had worked with uh, the fish and rights struggle up in uh, Washington uh, state, you know, at, before that, uh, you know, and, and so we had this uh, uh, foreknowledge and understanding of what uh, people had to do to resist, really, and to offer advice to tribal leaders and uh, uh, the community uh, elders. And so I would say that my uh, work at that time was the generation of uh, uh, much of my poetry, much of my uh, writing at that time as a journalist, you know. Uh, and so it was from there that I began to see myself as a writer. I wrote before that, you know, but uh, I felt that uh, my experience with an activist organization, NIYC, uh, was uh, very essential to what later on I focused most of my career on over the past uh, 50 or, or, or so years and uh, have published, uh, like I said in my bio, you know, uh, cultural, social, political uh, identity, which I think folk um, is faced or presented through uh, what I would call uh, resistance uh, efforts. So that's what I would, uh, I offer as a reply to you, uh, Nick, and I'm glad that uh, you're here. You know, when I, uh, when I say, I'm glad you're here, that you're here uh, in Pueblo uh, land and, and country, our home, you are welcome. Uh, and uh, I hope you continue to be here to help with our struggle. Thank, thank you, you for that really wonderful history, uh, Dr. Simon Ortiz. And also thank you for welcoming um, me to these homelands as somebody who's a guest. Um, so we're running out of time, but I do have a final question for Jennifer. And since she, Jennifer Marley, since she asked it, I'm gonna ask her to answer it. <laughs> um, so, Part of the, the goal of this exhibit, and I think Simon uh, really explained, uh, uh, gave a really great um, explanation of this, but indigenous movements are sites of knowledge production and they inspire art uh, and you know they, they produce kind of new knowledges, right? But oftentimes they're not seen uh, or credited with those kinds of you know, features or those kinds of histories or pushing art in, in a certain way or public histories in a certain way. Um, and, you know, the, the goal of this exhibit was to feature uh, red power uh, movements and to really think critically about um, what they mean and their impact on our, our present kind of moment. Um, and so when I think about, uh, you know, public art, I think about decolonizing, you know, public art and public spaces. Um, I think of a mural that was painted uh, several years ago by the Taos uh, Pueblo artist, uh, Lynette Houses in, in what is now uh, in o downtown Ogopoge or what is now known as Santa Fe. And I wanted to reflect on that. Uh, I wanted you to reflect on that uh, um, a little bit about how the, or excuse me, she's Taos Pueblo and Apache. Um, so um, I wanted you to reflect on that and that meaning and the significance of reclaiming that space uh, and that history, because the mural itself actually represents, I mean, you're represented in it. Uh, uh, your friend and relative Justine Teba is represented in it as well. But how does it actually reflect um, a larger kind of continuum of indigenous resistance? And what can places like the Albuquerque Museum do to be more accountable to indigenous communities uh, and indigenous stories? Sure. So I'll give a little bit of background uh, to how I first saw the mural. So it was actually being unveiled on the same day that the Red Nation planned a um, a march um, through the Santa Fe Plaza, and this was during Indian Market. And we chose that particular weekend to disrupt um, that space, which, like, let's be honest, Indian Market is for a white wealthy audience. Um, I mentioned earlier that you know, before, you know, we had squares and stuff, these tourists would just walk with thousands of dollars in cash on them through Indian market. And um, 
So we chose that day knowing there'd be a mass gathering of people and intentionally wanting to disrupt um, this event that Swaya puts on and that really like the city of Santa Fe depends on for economic sustainability. And what we did is um, we opened with prayer and we opened with dances from our youth. And then um, we silently marched through Indian Market and we stopped at different sites and talked about the significance of these sites because throughout the plaza, there's just so much deep and very, very violent history there. So um, we talked about the site I mentioned uh, where I was arrested, where um, Pueblo warriors were hung, where gallows stood. Um, we talked about um, some of the racist monuments throughout that area. We talked about the cathedral and the fact that it was built atop a shrine, which um, the Tewa name for that land is derived from Ogapogewinge, white shell water place or white shell watering place. And um, we wanted to take it as a moment to counteract all the narratives that the plaza itself and that Indian market creates. And so at the very end of the march, we realized that we happened to just so end right as a reception nearby our ending spot, like just a few meters away from our ending spot was, was being held and this was to unveil um, that mural. And so we just ended up taking the march into it, um, you know, un unannounced <laughs> and, um, we gave some final words in our final speeches there. Um, and it was really cool because they actually opened up, you know, they gave us the mic and they opened up that space to us, even though we showed up unannounced. And I think it was an example of exactly how things should be in that moment. And it's so rare that you, you see something like that happen in a place like Santa Fe, where something like a gallery opening or the unveiling of a piece of art is something very exclusive and, um, you know, you might otherwise be violently policed if you were to show up with a big group unannounced. Um, but in this case, you know, they gave us the mic, they gave us um, that visibility and that time to speak our truth. And um, actually, Patooch was there. Um, and that was really cool because um, he also, for, you know, for us, embodied these long legacies of Pueblo resistance and activism and we really admire him and his work he's done around challenging nuclear colonialism and so that's when I first saw the mural um, and I think that's when a lot of us like all saw that mural in person and um, to me it just you know symbolized as you know as we were trying to do with the march like the reclamation of Ogapo Gilwinge the reclamation of that space and um, you know there instead of a mural glorifying a conquistador you saw this mural um, celebrating the resistance of Pueblo women, um, you know, just again, less than a mile from the spot where um, I and others were brutalized, this mural now sits. And um, just right across from the cathedral too at the um, IAIA um, gift shop area. And so that was, that was really awesome. And I think that um, moving forward, there is, there is a lot of, I think there's a really intense psychological impact that art and public people and public people being represented in a way that isn't just where we're relegated to the past is, is, I think that psychological impact is very important moving forward. I think that public people themselves sometimes have a hard time accepting um, you know, the resistance we had to carry out in order to get free, in order to preserve our life ways. And I just really hope that um, things like that mural and things like these marches and these reclamation spaces can remind us that um, those traditions of resistance are a part of our traditions. They're just as precious. And um, hopefully we can start to see ourselves in a way that isn't just informed by the anthropo anthropological narratives that say pueblos were so docile and were the civilized ones um, because you know we're here because of our you know our righteous rage and the way we've stood up over time to the celebrations of genocide and genocide itself well thank you so much everyone um pilame ota uh, big thanks, many thanks to everyone for joining and sharing uh, your thoughts uh, this evening. Um, I want to encourage anyone who's listening or viewing right now to 
go to the Albuquerque Museum website uh, and check out the, the exhibit. There is a place uh, for comments at the end. Um, if you feel like there's something that you want to share, uh, if you yourself were a participant in any of these movements, there's a place to share your story at the end of the exhibit. And we encourage, you know, like I said, this isn't the only narrative. This isn't the only, uh, you know, exhibit. This isn't the final word on any of this. Um, this is just a, opening a conversation. And because of, you know, COVID-19 restrictions, we weren't able to include the kinds of things that we would in, in a physical exhibit. Um, but nonetheless, I do want to thank, uh, again, our panelists, um, uh, Dr. Simon J. Ortiz, uh, Dr. Jennifer Denetdale, uh, Jennifer Marley, and with us in spirit, um, Maris Chino, and also uh, everyone at the Albuquerque Museum for hosting this discussion, as well as hosting uh, these stories and these uh, narratives uh, about the Red Power Movement in New Mexico. So Wopi Latanka for everyone for joining uh, and hopefully I'll see some of you in person sometime soon. Thank you, uh, Nick.